All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Erica. I am the marketing manager of Code Day. And All right. Hi, everybody. Oh. My name is Erica. Oh. I am the one second. That's me. Sorry. Hi, My name is Erica. I am the marketing manager of Code Day. <laughs> Very sorry about that. That's okay. It's good to hear my voice twice. Um, anyways, I'm here with Steven. Uh, he has worked in um, Guild Wars 2 and um, also with uh, Shadows of Mordor, correct? Correct. And um, do you want to, you know, briefly introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about what you do in games? Absolutely. Uh, so my name, my name is uh, Steven Sidnicki, uh, he, him. Uh, I've been in game development for uh, what feels like forever, uh, probably only about 20-ish years. Um, most recently, that was working on Guild Wars 2, where I was part of the team for the second expansion that did uh, the mounts, as well as uh, doing some behind-the-scenes work on the first expansion uh, for Engine and such. Uh, let me see if I can chase down here a short video. Um, awesome. So this is uh, the skimmer mount, which is the one that I spent most of my time working on. Uh, I did not do the animations, of course, which are by far the most amazing thing here, but I was responsible for most of the physics involved in getting it to uh, twist around and to bob and weave in response to the terrain and such. Um, we also did, I also did, I should say, a lot of the behind the scenes systems with respect to keeping track of whether the player was on top of a mount, uh, getting the mounts to respond correctly to various actions, and uh, just a lot of the bookkeeping, which I think is probably the most underappreciated element of game dev or development in general. It's just how much of it is bookkeeping and getting data that currently exists in one place over to a different spot that needs it suddenly. Do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so, for instance, uh, one of the things in uh, Guild Wars 2, uh, as an AMMO, of course, is the concept of health. And so there are a lot of places where when you're getting attacked, when you're being healed, what have you, uh, you have the notion of player health and modifications to player health. And so having to suddenly make all of those locations aware of the notion that uh, the player might not actually be the health bar that you care about right now, that it might be the mount's health bar. Um, and so all of the information about changes to player health should instead be reflecting on what is the health of the mount. Uh, another example of that, and one that Guild Wars 2 has not changed as far as I know, um, would be something like the water level. Uh, right now, uh, the game has this notion of the water level be being kind of a global uh, zero coordinate. So there is, if you imagine that like all of the surface of the ocean on the earth was at exactly the same height, um, which it mostly is, then that's kind of the notion of the global water level. Uh, but of course, lakes, rivers, what have you, there are plenty of places on Earth where whether you're underwater or not does not depend on how high you are off of, you know, zero ground, as it were. Wow, I had never even thought of that. That's really interesting. Um, one of, I'm just going to dive into some of the questions now. Um, this is super cool. Thank you for sharing this, honestly. Um, so how did you get into the gaming industry and was it really difficult? I kind of backed into the games industry, to be honest. Um, it was not difficult, but at the time I did it, it was a much smaller industry. Uh, I think there was a span where it was harder. And frankly, I think uh, one of the great joys of the last uh, five to 10 years has been the uh, commoditizing of the tools necessary to make games so that honestly, anybody who wants to make a game now, I think can legitimately develop the skills and 
has the opportunity to get their work out there. Uh, so when I started, it was actually uh, the company that I was working with. Uh, I, I should say, I'm sorry. I was working with a company that was doing 3D software uh, for effects. For instance, uh, basic particle system effects or uh, some basic character animation style effects. Uh, this was well before uh, we had any of the fantastic tools for skeletons and such that you've got now. Mm -hmm. um, so we were doing some very basic kind of build a shape out of uh, these three boxes and then smooth them together into something that looks like an arm. Um, from that, I got hooked up with a game company that was interested in the effect software that we were using. Uh, this was a small company called Rocket Science Games uh, back in San Francisco and spent about a year for them working on a PlayStation game. Uh, learned one of the other universal truths of the industry, which is actually most games don't ship. Uh, that's a little bit less true than it used to be on the large scale simply because there is so much money involved in developing a game that it's no longer really cost effective to not put something out the door. Uh, but I think people really underestimate just how much work gets thrown out. Um, and about 2000, I started working for a company called uh, Surreal Software, which was working on uh, a couple of horror games for PlayStation 3 and Xbox. Uh, the Suffering was the main title that you might have heard of from them. Uh, they were working on a large open world game uh, for what was then Midway and then became Warner Brothers because another one of the universal truths of the game industry, as with any big industry, there's a lot of corporate motion that goes around behind the scenes. Right, yeah. Um, Surreal eventually got absorbed by Warner Brothers. And so I started working with uh, Warner Brothers on um, War in the North, which is one of the Lord of the Rings games, and then spent a little while on Shadow over Mordor. What did you do uh, with after that? Shadows? I wound up. Hmm? Sorry, what did you do with uh, Shadows of Mordor? I was working with the dialogue system there, uh, so I was involved in prototyping and designing the technical side of the uh, unique dialogue structure, where individuals in the game can both have their own set of lines as well as a global palette of lines almost that they can use to react to specific behaviors. So you could say that all orcs are going to react to getting hit with the same dialogue line, let's say, but this one will also have a couple of special lines if you try and talk to them about weaponry. Okay, that's really neat. And do you know a little bit about how, like, I have played Shadows of Mordor before, and the enemies, like, remember how you tried to kill them last time, right? Do you know what goes behind that type of, like, enemy remem remembrance type of programming? Yeah, it is. Uh, that comes down to a great extent to bookkeeping again. Mm. Um, the notion behind that is that you can keep track of... Uh, any number of parameters essentially associated with past history. For instance, uh, for combat, you might say, have a parameter that indicates how many strikes, when you were fighting this enemy the first time, how many strikes you took in close combat versus how many ranged attacks you did, and which set of them were more effective. Uh, and then the AI for the enemies can take advantage of that information to say if it was more uh, close combat than ranged, then I am going to try and stay at a greater distance next time. Okay. Uh, a lot of game AI is this notion of responding to specific states and specific information. Uh, and in fact, the state machine, which is essentially a giant graph of behaviors and ways of going from one behavior to another is still the main conceptual structure behind game AI. 
we have a live question. Yeah. Um, what programming experience did you have prior to becoming a game dev? So I got into games, like I said, from computer graphics. So I'd already had a few years of experience with developing computer graphics. Um, at the time, the only language that I had was uh, C and then a couple of smaller languages like basic and the like. Um, I wouldn't say that I had a lot of programming experience. Uh, I probably had three to four years. I was doing personal programming projects um, even before that point, just in high school and college, I had a lot of small games that I developed for myself. Um, I think it's less necessary to have programming experience now to make games because the tools are so very good. Unity, for instance, there are so many libraries available that you can focus on the game structure from a design perspective or you can focus on the game structure from an art perspective, build your own art, and then connect the pieces uh, with either Unity or even something like uh, RPG Maker, where it'll do all of the programming bookkeeping for you, all of the engine structure for you, and allow you to focus on narrative, let's say. Um, I think where programming comes in handy for everybody involved is just being able to understand what these tools are doing behind the scenes mm. because so much of game programming and so much of game development in general is just reasoning about behaviors that programming is programming as a way of talking about behavior or even mathematics as a way of talking about these systems I think is a fundamental school skill, even if you're not applying it directly to uh, the game itself in terms of recognizing what the game is going to do to react to some piece of new content or what have you. Okay, that's really sound advice. Um, I think that, yeah, these days programming, there's so many options and that there's so much flexibility now that it's like, almost easier to pick up new things than it was prior, um, before when gaming really just started to explode. Um, you mentioned that you did some personal projects in school. What were some of those projects and did they help you get into the gaming industry? Did you use them in your resume or um, did you just kind of fall? It sounded like you kind of just fell into gaming, um, just kind of happenstance. <laughs> uh, honestly, it did. Uh... It's, I won't recommend my career path for everybody. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, I did more or less luck into it in a lot of ways, and uh, I don't want to sell that short. Um, sure. My personal projects at the time were very simple games, uh, almost Flappy Bird analogs, in that it was just navigating a space with somewhat limited controls. Um, it was it was a maze game of sorts was the one that I really remember from uh, from back before I started doing it professionally, uh, where you had to try and get, get from one end of the screen to the other uh, as the screen side scrolled along on you. Mm. Um, these days, my my projects are more along the lines of puzzles and uh, puzzle style games. Um, I like word games quite a bit, so I've been uh, developing some word games and. I like spatial puzzling uh, along the lines of uh, either Sokoban, for instance, to, to give a classic example, a game like The Witness would be a more uh, modern version of not quite the same principles, but of the general puzzle structure. And so those sorts of puzzle games that interact, uh, sorry, that interface puzzles with an external structure I find really appealing. Awesome. And so that's, that's what my personal projects have been lately. Uh, I've never really used my personal projects as a gateway, but I think they are one of the most effective gateways in. If you have something that you've done uh, that you can talk about with passion, it shows not only that you have uh, worked on games before, that, that you have a little bit of experience with what's involved in building a game, but it also shows that you've got the experience with just general project management and that you understand 
how to build things. Right, yeah. It, a lot of our students at our code days and hackathons and things like that, they build video games and they end up continuously working on them after the hackathon is over. And um, it just really builds that portfolio that's necessary for getting into the industry. And I think that just even having that even saying that you've worked on a project, you don't even have to show it. Just saying like, this is the experience I've had is super valuable. Um, many of our students though, believe that it's too hard to get into gaming and they think that it's too competitive to even get a chance. Um, do you think that working in games is too discouraging, you know, these days? Or do you think that students should still try to reach for it if given, you know, an opportunity or, you know, should they look for opportunities? Honestly, I think now is a fantastic time. If you'd asked me that question five years ago, I might have had a somewhat less positive answer to it. Mm. Uh, but I think the games industry has gotten a lot better over the last several years, um, both in terms of being a place to work, but also in terms of being able to break into it. Uh, I really do think that right now is a great time to be trying to get into games. It is very competitive, but it's also a field where you can make yourself stand out. And this is where the personal projects really matter, is that if you can put together a personal project that shows what you can bring to the table, then that can make a huge difference in the eyes of a recruiter and in the eyes of uh, the engineer who's looking at your work and uh, interviewing you. We have a live question um, in response to that. You mentioned that the gaming industry has become a better place to work. What would you say the culture of the gaming industry is like? That's a big question. Um, I know, it's a lot. <laughs> oh yeah. So first of all, I would say that uh, the most important thing to know is that it's not uniform. Uh, different places still have vastly different cultures from each other. Uh, so I'll speak here because I had different experiences at different studios. I'll speak primarily to uh, ArenaNet and then I won't name the place before that, but there was a studio that I worked at previous to that that was uh, a good example of a negative experience. Uh, oh. ArenaNet is flatly one of the most amazing places that I've worked. Uh, they had uh, very good management structures in place. They had uh, people all the way up the ladder to the top that actively cared about the people as much as the work. Um, and it is one of the few places that I've worked that really fostered discussion about how to work and not just what you were working on. Uh, it's one of the few places that I've been able to openly talk about things like depression or ADHD and the kind of impact that they can have on work and the kind of workarounds that you can use for them. Um, and that had a huge impact on me personally. Uh, That's amazing. There, I will say there is still, uh, even there, there was a little bit of a culture of crunch uh, from time to time. Mm -hmm. That is so vastly different than it used to be. Um, the first job that I had in the industry, uh, we were working in preparation for an E3, trying to get a demo together. And I did back-to-back -back weeks of between 90 and 100 hours uh, getting ready for that demo. Wow. And that simply does not happen anymore on a professional level as far as I can tell. And thank heavens it doesn't because Human beings should not live that way. Right. Um, one of the things about gaming that I really do enjoy is that most people in gaming, not everybody, uh, but most people do consider themselves fans of the genre as a whole. And there's a pretty good breadth of uh, fandom, even within individual uh, studios. Like Guild Wars 2 was an MMO, and there were a lot of people working on it who loved MMOs. But there were a lot of people working on it who didn't really care for MMOs that much, but loved gaming in general. Um, I, I will say this up front. I was a terrible MMO player. Uh, <laughs> I still am. I, I'm, 
I'm not a great Guild Wars 2 player. Uh, I do not grind well, but I loved that game and I loved the aspects of the project that I got to work on. And so I didn't have to be good at games to be a game developer. And that's actually something that I wish were better recognized is that the skills necessary to play games and the skills necessary to build games have some overlap, but they're really not the same. Right. And, you know, you don't have to like be good at video games to know what kind of experience is, is valuable to the players. Exactly. Is another really important thing that mm -hmm. I think that people in gaming should, you know, learn and should know before they get into the industry, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can actually, can I get on my soapbox on that for just a moment? Sure. So this is more a design statement than a programming statement. Uh, but I think probably the single most, personally, the single most important skill for game design is the ability to look at something that you don't like and understand what other people like about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can study things, stepping outside of yourself, and learn what makes them tick and what makes them not tick, uh, that skill will get you further in uh, game design and honestly design in general than I think just about any other individual skill. Absolutely, like, yeah, knowing both ends is really valuable and, and would make you stand out for sure. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, do you think starting with indie games like as a starting place is a, is like a good place to begin your career or is or is working in indie games like more of a i worked in in corporations first and now i can work in indie games is it like a before or after type of experience for somebody's career i think it can be both very easily um i've known people who went from large studios and went indie and had a fantastic time of it I've known people who worked at smaller studios and then uh, went up to larger places and did very well with that. Uh, I think there are two different facets of game development. A lot of the technical skills and a lot of the core development skills overlap between them. Um, the environments may be different and a lot of the uh, the flow, if you will, the workflow tends to be different between a hundred person or a 300 person team and a five person team. Uh, but the experiences are universal enough that you can absolutely go back and forth. That's awesome. That's good to know. Um, yeah, indie games seem to have kind of a different structure and culture in, compared to corporations and, and the corporate way of, mm -hmm. of working. <laughs> absolutely. And I will say that uh, what I mentioned that most of the people that I was involved with at ArenaNet and at most of the big studios were also uh, game fans in one fashion or another. Uh, most of the people that I've known in the industry are big indie game fans. Uh, there's a lot of recognition of the smaller scale projects and the creativity behind them that I think doesn't always get reflected out to the gaming community at large. Thank you for answering that. Um, is working on mods for games a great way to get your foot in the door in the industry? Someone just asked. That I can't really speak to as well. Um, I think it depends on where you're trying to get your foot in. For programming, it can be, but I would lean a little bit more towards uh, developing in an engine than developing mods per se, but that is really my personal experience speaking there. I think anything outside of programming, whether that's design or art or even audio, um, mods are a great way in. They can showcase those skills very well. Uh, I just don't have enough experience with the mod side of things from a programming perspective to be able to speak well to whether that's a good way of getting your foot in the door. That's fair. Um, so where would be like a good way 
to get noticed in the gaming community, just to kind of get your foot in the door, even if you're not really ready to apply yet, but you want a place to go where you can like, you know, keep up with, you know, news and things like that. Like, I know that I found you in a Discord server. Like, how do students get themselves involved in the community and get noticed and recognized before applying? Uh, this is, well, times are hard for this now, I'll say that much. Well, yeah. Um, but this is where I think local organizations are a huge uh, connection point. Uh, in Seattle, of course, we have uh, the Seattle Indie Games Group. Uh, there is the IGDA on a more national and global level. Uh, there's the Game Developers uh, Conference and Associated Communities. Pretty much any large town or city will have a local gaming organization, uh, usually an indie group of one form or another. And those are fantastic starting points. Uh, one of the things that I still have a hard time internalizing and I think is a common issue with people who are new to games is that nobody out there is your competition. You're all trying to do the same thing and it really is a situation where a rising tide lifts all boats. If your game is good, if somebody else's game is good, you're going to be helping them and they're going to be helping you because you're building a larger community, whether it's in your area or in gaming in general. Um, and I think that is very broadly recognized within uh, game development and that there is much more a spirit of uh, cooperation and mutual aid than any sort of kind of competitive aspect to uh, different people working on different teams. I absolutely love that. And I love how it's more team oriented and not so like, backstabby or anything mm -hmm. negative at all in terms of working in the game industry like everyone is there for each other and that's what i really wanted the students to know from this mm -hmm. expert lunch is just like the gaming industry is not super shut out it is is less competitive than you would think absolutely and there's actually one piece of that that i think uh i see lots of people making the mistake about um nobody wants to steal your ideas Anybody who's working in games, almost anybody who's working in games, has five personal projects of their own sitting in a directory on a, on a USB stick that they haven't looked at for a year and feel guilty about. <laughs> They're not going to take your project if you bring it to them and ask them for advice. <laughs> uh, be upfront about the things that you're working on. Show off the work that you do as much as you possibly can. People are way more interested in helping you bring that thing to fruition than they are in taking it from you and bringing it to fruition themselves. Absolutely, and thank you for saying that. Like, abs like ah, finally, it's being said. Um, so somebody asked live earlier, you mentioned uni Unity, and they feel like there is somewhat a learning curve, like so many things in coding, but is there a game engine you strongly recommend for a new developer? I know we're jumping around a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is fine. Uh, sadly, I don't. Uh, my husband has worked with Game Maker and had a lot of success with that. Uh, I have not touched that in many years now, and I can't speak to uh, the current state of that. Uh, Unity is a huge learning curve. Um, RPG Maker is one that I know you know, for specific games, if you want to focus on kind of the design aspects, it's a great one for that. Uh, Godot is one that I've heard many good things about. Mm, um, I've heard about sadly, it. I do not know uh, the entry level uh, game development engines very well. Um, the thing that I've had the most success with in personal projects is actually raw JavaScript of all things. Huh. Um, the thing that helps for me with that is that it's a language where you can get very quick, immediate feedback, visual feedback on the things that you're doing. And for me, the process of iteration in building a design, I find that I work much better when I can see a preliminary thing of the preliminary version of the thing that I'm working on and iterate that to something that looks better 
And I found just JavaScript as a language to be an incredible tool for that. But in terms of the um, libraries that are out there and the tools that are out there, uh, unfortunately, I don't have much stronger advice. That's totally fine. Um, someone also asked earlier, and it's not related, I'm sorry. But um, in game development, how are responsibilities divided up in a team, um, game elements and me mechanisms? How is cohesion maintained? Not always well. Uh, project management really is a thing unto itself. And it's, it is a career. And it's actually a career that I wish more people had respect for because it's they project managers are the glue of game development. They're the people who are really responsible for making sure that all of the amazing creative work comes together into something that actually sees store shelves. Um, and so the first answer to that is there are professional people who do this work, who divvy up the tasks and keep track of uh, all of the bits and pieces. Beyond that, uh, a lot of studios have kind of a, what I've seen called a matrix organization, where you have disciplines and projects. So for instance, you have the developers, you have the designers, you have the artists, and that'll often break down into different groups, for instance, for character design versus character animation versus texturing and 2D painting, et cetera. Uh, programming will break down into engine programming versus front-end programming versus tools programming. And then you also have a separation by project where you have the design team for the current expansion versus the design team that is working on prototyping for the next expansion. Uh, because uh, another underestimated aspect, I think, of game development as a profession is just how long it takes to get a game out the door. Uh, most of the large scale games that you see now are in development for five years, if not longer. Uh, even on Guild Wars 2, something like the expansions that we worked on, there was one to two years of active development and many months of prototype development uh, behind the scenes on each of those. I know that some of the content that I was working on uh, when I left ArenaNet more than a year ago, has only just started coming out now. Wow. That's crazy. So there's a lot of lead time and uh, there's a lot of separation kind of by project stage. Which makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone asked, is it more often that large game companies use pre-existing game engines or make their own? It used to be more make your own, and most large game companies have an in-house engine that they use for things and a team dedicated to uh, maintaining that engine. That has changed and is continuing to change. Uh, I would say that the real start of that was uh, Unreal Engine 3 actually was the first one that studios looked at and said, this is at a point where it really does most of the things that our internal engines do we can take this and build games on top of it. I also and so for instance, that. when I was at Warner Brothers, uh, Unreal Engine 3 was the engine that was being used for several of the games that were in development at the time. Um, and now UE4, of course, takes uh, a lot of that at, uh, at larger studios. Um, for Unity has the reputation of being for mobile and smaller games and uh, not without reason, but there are amazing projects in Unity, and it is the right tool for a lot of jobs. Um, there are still game studios that do their own engines, and it's still a very viable uh, path, both for making games and for a career. Uh, but I think that the tools out there are so good right now that anybody who's starting out should probably consider starting from an existing engine rather than building their own. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. And I heard that Unity is really expensive, like somewhere in the millions um, to use. Uh, well, so Unity can be licensed expensively, but the core tool set of Unity is free. 
and oh. many games are released with essentially that core tool set. At worst, uh, if you're if you're a project on anything smaller scale than a team of dozens, uh, your licensing is only going to be some small portion of profits, is my understanding. Okay. Uh, I have not dug deeply into Unity licensing, but you can absolutely build a game on it and even release a game on it for free with no upfront cost to you. Okay. Yeah, I I probably have heard about licensing being really expensive. <laughs> licensing can be really expensive, and for large companies it is. Um, yeah. But those are also the places that can afford really expensive licenses. Absolutely. <laughs> um, how much would you say that freelancers and contracted talent are involved in the game building process and how many people are actually part of the company? So most of the studios that I've worked with have used a mix of the two. Um, freelancing is often used for art. Uh, one thing that is almost always uh, farmed out as it were is uh, localization which is the process of taking your game and getting it into another language. Uh, most games that are released now are released in six or seven different languages. Uh, French, Italian, German, Spanish, and Russian are the most common. Mm -hmm. um, and that work is almost always done by professional translators out of house. Uh, that said, the majority of the team working on any given game that I've been a part of has been within the studio itself. I would say that the mix is seldom less than probably 70, 30. Okay. That's not too bad. Mm -hmm. um, here's a super interesting question. In your 20 years in the game industry, have you noticed an increase in diversity and inclusion of like more women and people of color? Or has it just kind of been so I think that's really ramped up in the last uh, few years, especially. Um, but it was flat for a long time. I will say right out, uh, it took me 10 years of game programming to work with a female engineer. Wow. Um, and that is miserable. Uh, straight up, like women should have been part of this. And women, there were women in game development from very, very early on. Uh, the, the canonical example that I know of is uh, the Centipede arcade game, uh, 1981, I want to say, uh, had a, a woman developer. Wow. Um, and there were a few women at Atari games in the early 90s working on uh, arcade games for them. Uh, but I would say that the diversity has exploded in the last five to ten years and Honestly, the indie scene has been responsible for a big piece of that uh, in the same way that, for instance, the indie music community seeds popular music going forward. Uh, indie games really seed the games industry. And the explosion of games in personal voices that happened around, I would say, the turn of the decade where you had games like... Uh, her story or um, uh, Edith, Edith Finch. Um, these, these very personalized, very emotional storytelling experiences, um, people really building games in their own voices to tell their stories, uh, I think have outright led to a greater diversity in the games industry as a whole. Right, and I've noticed really progressive characters in as main characters in games, which is really amazing. Um, I think it's The Last of Us Part Two. The, you play as a lesbian character, and mm -hmm. it's just super amazing to see that there's so many people supportive of this game and of this character and just seeing her story unfold with her partner, it's just, it's such a great story and we need more of that for sure in the gaming industry. But it's just so awesome that we're finally like seeing more of this. Um, it's super inspiring, just incredible. Um, Absolutely, and I wanna say, um, there was one very negative incident at ArenaNet. Uh, I won't go into the details on it, but 
uh, there was a small explosion around uh, the studio founder, um, maybe 2018-ish, somewhere in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and I have very mixed feelings about that. Uh, but ArenaNet as a whole, uh, really committed to diversity in ways that I have not seen from many other studios. Um, there was a, a special in interest group within the company uh, devoted to diversity issues with one of the company vice presidents as a member of the group and bringing issues from the group regularly up to uh, top management. And you know, we, we didn't feel as listened to as we wanted to be, quite honestly, because I think there is no, uh, no group that is listened to as much as they deserve, frankly, on diversity issues. But um, the fact that voices were getting heard at all uh, was a positive. And that, is, that has absolutely changed in the industry in just the last decade or so. And maybe even this conversation being live right now will spike some more conversations and, you know, hopefully push gaming in the right direction. I hope so. And I'll, I'll be blunt here. I'm an old white guy. I can only speak old white guy with any real confidence. <laughs> um, but I, I have enough. Well, I, as I mentioned, I've got a husband. And I've had uh, my share of issues with uh, depression and ADHD and probably several other people share as well. So I at least have an appreciation for some of the issues that can uh, act as barriers to people in the industry. And to the extent that I can use my voice to amplify uh, underserved voices, uh, I'm very much trying to do that now. So thank you for being so open and, and sharing all of that with us. Um, that's just really incredible insight and it's really appreciated. Um, going back to, I think I sent you this question before um, from Melody. She wants to know if it's true that companies fire tons of employees after a game is finished. And if so, does it happen that often? It doesn't happen often, but it is the thing that has happened, uh, especially in the past. That's one of the industry practices that I think people learned about as it was going away to a certain extent. Um, it absolutely was an industry practice, but bluntly, it's a terrible practice. Um, especially in the modern games world where either you're building your game as a service and there, there are economics behind this that we could go into for, for days, and I'm not an expert in those, but I'm a side interested observer sometimes. But mm. the whole notion that games are now a service, whether it's something like a Destiny or whether it's your favorite mobile gotcha game, you're not just releasing the game, you're releasing the game and giving players a reason to play it for the next year or several years. Mm. Um, or you're releasing a sequel to, you know, the Last of Us, for instance. Um, but studios just cannot afford to have all of the, or have even a substantial portion of the uh, community knowledge and skill set of a game vanish into the ether. So that practice really doesn't happen anymore for the most part um, because it doesn't make any sense for studios to do it. Uh, it is absolutely a thing that has happened, and one thing that does still happen to a certain extent is that you will pick up a lot of people in the rush to get the game out the door that are not necessarily part of the core team. Uh, this is where the discussion about freelancers previously comes in as well, mm. is that you'll sometimes use freelancers for uh, late artwork, for instance, um, or again, for, for late audio. Uh, for dialogue. Right. And those people are at much greater risk, I think, of uh, kind of evaporating from the team before the next project starts up. Or I should say before the next project goes into full production. Right. They're given a contract and once their work is done, then the company doesn't really need them anymore. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and I do think that those practices were more common in the past, but that's something where 
kind of the reputation for the practice has lingered a lot longer than the practice itself. So we're kind of running out of time and I think I want to end it on a more, on some more inspirational notes. Um, what kind of advice would you give to students if they, if students that really want to get into the gaming industry, what is some piece of information you would give them if they were to approach you and be like, hey, how do I get into gaming and, and whatnot? Uh Multifold, I guess, first of all, make games. There really is no better way of getting an appreciation for doing it professionally than doing it uh, on a personal level. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there for people who are interested in the process. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, name some names here. Uh, do you mind if I mention a couple of websites and such? Um, yeah, you can absolutely um, send us some links and then we can make them uh, available to all our attendees. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll go ahead and do that uh, post facto then. But uh, I will say that a lot of game developers are uh, very enthusiastic about talking about game development with uh, people who are interested in the field. Uh, you can find a bunch of blogs out there um, and whether it's specialized or just general information, uh, there's plenty of info out there, but first and foremost, make games. You've got a game in you somewhere. Start small because you've got a huge game in you somewhere that you'll never release. <laughs> but you've probably got some small project that you can do that you'd just like to see out there. Uh, make a game. That's great. I love that. Is a good note to end on as well. Um, I don't have any more live questions. Um, All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and providing such great insight into the industry and just into the culture and about diversity and just we've we've flown all over the place in conversation, but um, we would love to have you come back um, and see you possibly at a code day. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'd be absolutely delighted to return. Yes, this is good news. All right, I will see you around. All right, take care.